Hello Facebook and hello Periscope. Prophet David Taylor here for your weekly live a prophetic word. Uh, this is my regular time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time on Sunday. And then I also appear on the second Thursday of every month uh, teaching a series called No More Genies, second Thursday night at 7 p.m. Okay? So I'm here with uh, uh, our live weekly prophetic word. And today's prophetic word is Answers Part 2. Answers Part 2. The video I did last week was Answers Part 1. And this is Answers Part 2. Answers to what? Answers to why everything that's happening on earth is happening right now. So let's pray and jump right on in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you just thanking you. Thanking you, God. Thanking you for your mercy and your grace and your blood and your word and your power and your presence. And the fact that you never change. There's not even a shadow of turning with you. So thank you, God, in times like this for being our rock. For letting us know that we are safe under your blood and safe uh, in your word. No matter what happens, we're safe in Christ with you. So fill me with the Holy Ghost right now, God. Speak through my mouth, my hand gestures, every word I say. Breathe through me. Breathe in me and through me, oh God, so that what you want said might be said on this broadcast. That the saints might be edified and hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, oh God. And that we might move forward in obedience and fear of God. And I thank you for it and I believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So. I strongly, strongly encourage you to watch last week's video where I talked about answers, answers to why the beer bug is here. And I'm saying beer bug because I think if you name it on YouTube that something, you get a strike on your video, so I'm just going to call it the beer bug. But you know what I'm talking about, why the beer bug is here and why it's sweeping the world. So I strongly, strongly encourage you to watch last week's video because I go into specifics and details about the things we need to repent of. But I want to reiterate, I want to, uh, again, show people what's happening. Do you know, have you ever played chess or checkers and somebody got mad and just threw the board up and then all the chess pieces, all the checker pieces got scattered and you had to start over? Have you ever played Monopoly and somebody got mad? I know we did that a lot when I was a kid. Somebody got mad, just threw the board up and just took their hand and just, you know, wiped everything off. Have you ever done that? Okay, I'll stop by to tell you, that's what's happening in the world right now, is that God is taking his mighty hand and just wiping stuff out. Just wiping stuff out. I want you to notice that when death first hit, death hit in 2016 with the death of David Bowie. Remember that? He died in January, and from 2016 to this point, there's been all kinds of celebrities, but it's all been all kinds of, like, weird stuff. Like unexpected stuff, like people dying tragically, like Kobe Bryant died, the way he died, just out of nowhere, just tragically. And people large and small, people from all walks of life. And then another thing I noticed from 2016 is that the saints started dying too. When the saints start dying, we in trouble. Okay? When the saints start dying, we in trouble. So I want you to notice that the death kind of came in trickles. It kind of came, and sometimes we would get, you know, three celebrity deaths in a week or maybe in a day, but it was still kind of coming in trickles. And then I want you to notice that when the beer bug hit, what happened? Death started coming by the hundreds. And then it started coming by the hundreds per day. And now it's coming by the thousands per day. Can you see that? Are you following on the news about how the, the rate per day has increased? You know why? That's this happening. That's the chessboard being cleared. That's the checkerboard being cleared. That's the monopoly board being cleared. Okay? Well, you say, well, do you have any scriptural reference for, for that? Has that happened before? Yes, that happened before. It happened with the flood waters of Noah. Remember? When the people were warned and warned and warned and warned, and God said, I looked in the heart of mankind, and I didn't find anything but evil continually from their youth up. God looks at the kids as... Let me take this moment to tell you that there's no excuse for you if you're a child, if you didn't know that. I know that some cultures teach you and say you're just a kid, but that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you're responsible for the meditations of your heart. 
Whenever you are conscious enough to make decisions, God counts you too. God counts what you're thinking. And God said in the days of Noah that the meditations of man were evil continually from his youth up. So in America, we teach kids that basically being a teenager is kind of a playground, that you can kind of do whatever you want and nothing's your fault. Unless, of course, if you kill somebody, if you kill somebody, they will try you as an adult. But just about everything you do, every habit you build in your life as a teen in our country, people excuse it by youth, but God does not. You're responsible for the choices that you make before the Lord, and you're responsible for the motives. You're responsible for what's driving you in here. And so God has had a situation with us before on earth where he looked at how people were living and he was so displeased with what he saw that he wiped us out. And he wiped us out down to one family. That family was eight people. That was Noah and his wife, and then Noah's three sons and their wives. And those were the only people left on earth, and God wiped everybody else out with a flood. So after that ordeal was over, God put the rainbow in the sky as a promise. And God said, that's why you see rainbows after thunderstorms. Because God said, I do set my bow in the clouds to promise humanity. When you come on the video, please like and share. Because remember I told you when God's releasing a prophetic word, everybody needs to hear it. So please like and share this video as you come on the broadcast. So God told humanity, he made the promise with the rainbow in the cloud that I will never again destroy the earth by water. He was very specific. So that's why no matter how bad it rains, you tend to see rainbows after it rains. That's God honoring his promise that no matter how bad it rains, it's never, the earth is never going to flood again and wipe us out. But he never just said, he never said he was never going to wipe people out again. He said he wasn't going to wipe us out by water. He was very specific. So that's what I mean when I say there is a biblical precedent for God wiping out masses. And that's what's happening right now. As I said at the beginning, if you notice how the body counts are increasing by the hundreds and the thousands by day. So just like I said in my first video, Answers Part 1, go back and watch that video to get the specifics. It's because we need to repent. The saints of God, believers, need to repent. Okay? I'm not talking to unbelievers. I'm not talking to people that don't know the Lord in terms of uh, you know, where things have to start. But yes, if you are an unbeliever, now's the time to repent. Now's the time to turn away from your own plan and your own thought and turn to the God of heaven through the Lord Jesus Christ and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is time to get born again and get saved. But for those that are already born again and saved, what we have to do is, again, I outlined it in the first video, but we have to turn to the Lord with all of our hearts. We have to tear down our idols. We have to tear down our false gods. See, because you cannot just accept Jesus as Savior. You have to also accept him as Lord. I'm talking to people that are already Christians now. If you are not born again, you need to repent and get saved. Become born again. Get right with Father God through the Lord Jesus Christ and then walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. But for those of you that are already saved and already born again, you cannot just accept Jesus as Savior. Romans 5, 1 and 2, I'm reading out of the Berean Study Bible. Uh, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Let me read that out of New King James. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith, and to this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's accepting Jesus as Savior. That means you are justified. You are rightly aligned. If this is God and we were out of alignment with him, we are now realigned with God. The same way you would justify text on a newspaper in a, a document. You would line that text up to the left or center it or to the right. That's called justifying the text. Well, when it's, the Bible says that we are justified with God, we are lined back up with God through the Lord Jesus Christ because of his shed blood. Because his shed blood paid the price for our sins and took away our con condemnation. That's Romans 8.1.
There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The reason that there's no condemnation to believers is not because sin doesn't deserve condemnation, but because Jesus already took it in his body and paid for it on the cross. Therefore, you don't have to pay again. The same price does not have to be paid twice. That's the beauty of God's salvation. Not that sin doesn't have to be paid for, but that you didn't have to pay for it. Jesus paid for it. That's accepting him as Savior. That's the part that everybody loves. That's the part that everybody preaches. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That is not incorrect, but it is incomplete. You cannot just accept Jesus as Savior. You have to also accept him as Lord. So he took our con condemnation, Romans 8, 1. We can accept him as Savior, Romans 5, 1. But then there is Romans 12, 1 and 2. <clears throat> I'll start with the King James, because that's my favorite. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And there's a lot of teaching that is just moved away from this truth. This is accepting Jesus as Lord. Okay? So accepting him uh, as Savior is easy because all you have to do is ABC. All you have to do is stand there and receive it because Jesus already did all the work. That's why everybody loves that. A, B, C. Admit you're a sinner. Believe Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross for your sins and rose again on the third day. And confess that with your mouth as you believe it in your heart. A, B, C. That's all it takes to become born again and be saved because the Lord paid the price. Okay? But you can't just accept him as Savior. You've got to accept him as Lord. So that's why Paul says, I beseech you. Therefore, brother, and I beseech you because it's something you have to choose to do because God is not going to force you. But Paul has spent all that time t showing you the goodness of God, showing you his love, showing you what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. So then Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brother, and by the mercies of God, the fact that God had enough mercy on us to allow the Son of God to become human and to shed his blood. By the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice. What does that mean? That means you have to take up your cross every day. Well, what does that mean? That means you have to lay down your self-will. You have to let go of your self-directed life. You have to say to the Lord what Jesus said to Father in the garden, not my will but thine be done. You have to surrender. If you're driving down the highway of life and you're working your plan and you're going where you want to go and you got the wheel, what that means is you got to take your hand off the wheel, you got to get out the car, go over to the passenger side and let the Lord take the wheel. And then if the Lord takes you somewhere you don't want to go, which he will, you got to learn how to trust him. you got to learn to let Jesus take the wheel. And even though the Lord is going to drive you through some places that wouldn't have been your choice, you have to learn how to trust him. You have to let him be the Lord. you got to do what he's telling you to do. Okay? You present your body as a living sacrifice. That's what that means. Holy, that means pure. That means we're not living in things that are displeasing to God on the spiritual level or on the flesh level. On the flesh level... You know, fornication, gluttony, adultery, uh, you know, violence, murder, thou shalt not kill on the flesh level, on the spiritual level, uh, envy, greed, jealousy, uh, racism, covetousness, that's on the spiritual level. All those things are unholy. So you cannot walk in holiness by yourself. You need the blood of Jesus to cleanse you, but you do have to be willing. God will supply supply the cleansing through the blood and he will supply the power through the Holy Spirit but it still has to be your choice okay acceptable to God which is your reasonable service in other words you have to live a life that when God examines it when God weighs it in the balance God says that life is acceptable before me don't overthink it because it's no different from the way it is with your kids. It doesn't matter how much you love your children. There's some behavior that you would say is just not acceptable. I want you to think about that because that's key to what's going on with the beer bug on the earth right now. I don't care how much you love your child. I don't care how much you love your child. 
I don't care how much you love your child. There's some behavior that if your child does both in private and in public and in your house and in school, where you will say that behavior is not acceptable. Okay? You can't tell me that you can't understand that. You can understand that. Okay? Well, that's the same thing that the scripture is saying to us, is that there are some choices, some lifestyles, some paths that people walk, that Christians walk, that are not acceptable to God, not pleasing to God, not what the Lord wants. And if you're unsure as to what that is, that's what the scriptures are for. You have to search the scriptures so you can read God's thoughts. That's why we have a Bible. And you have to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what is or is not pleasing in your life before the Lord. Okay? And then it says, which is your reasonable service. Okay? You understand what that means? That means that it's not too much to ask of God for you to accept him as Lord. After all he's done for you and shown his love for you, his unconditional love for you, and after all that he did to get you saved on the cross, he's shown you that he loves you. So it's not unreasonable for God to ask his children to live holy and acceptable lives before him. And then Romans 12, 2 <clears throat> goes on to say, and be not conformed to this world. We're supposed to be different from worldly people. We're supposed to be different from unbelievers. But be ye transformed. That means it's a process. It doesn't happen all at once. You go from something to something. By the renewing of your mind, what does that mean? Well, in the Greek, that means that you make your thoughts new. And the only way to make your thoughts new is to read his word. You get in God's word, you hear God's word preached to you by your pastor, your apostle, your prophet, your spiritual leader, and you read the scriptures for yourself. So you can hear God's thoughts, and then you have to crucify your thoughts and crucify your way and crucify a self-directed life so that you can receive God's thoughts, receive God's commandments, and let him be your Lord, okay? Uh, for example, that you may, well, I'll get to that in a minute. For example, I'll just use my own time. I'll use my own life. I would not be prophesying if the Lord hadn't called me to do it because I'm an introvert. So I'm the kind of brother where <laughs> if you give me a, a piano and a laptop and a slice of pizza and a glass of Pepsi, I'm good. I'll go in there and I'll play my piano and I'll write some music and I'm good. That's who I am, me, David, naturally as a person. But the Lord called me to prophesy, and he made that clear to me from a child, okay? So the only reason that I'm out here is because the Lord told me to come out here. So I laid down. I had to say, not my will, but thine be done. I had to lay down what I wanted to do, take up my cross, crucify my self-direction, and do what the Lord told me to do, okay? So just to use my own life as an example. So then the verse goes, Romans 12, and, uh, Romans 12 and 2 goes on to say that you, you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So in other words, what that means is that the will of God is not automatic. That's another thing that confuses people. They think that when you get saved, and both saints and sinners believe this, that when you get saved, that whatever God wants to happen is just going to happen. That is incorrect. You, because the word of God, the will of God, comes in levels. The word of God and the will of God comes in stages. The word of God and the will of God comes in progression. Revelation from God is progressive. God never tells you everything all at once. God takes you from level to level, faith to faith, and glory to glory. So then to give you a real life analogy, I want you to imagine uh, an academic school system. If you're in America, you know the system we grow up in, kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, ninth, 10, 11, 12th grade, and then that's the end of high school. Then after that, you have advanced education. You go to trade school, tech school, community college. You can go for a two-year university, four-year university. You can go for advanced degrees, master's, double master's, and PhDs. You can go all the way up to becoming a doctor of philosophy of your subject. That's what this is talking about. That's the way it works in the kingdom. It's exactly the same. When you first come in the kingdom of God, you are at a kindergarten level. Okay, you just got saved. You have to learn the basics. You have to learn the word. You have to learn the voice of the Holy Spirit. You have to learn all that stuff that's at the kindergarten level. 
And then as you go, you learn more and God reveals more to you and you grow from faith to faith, level to level and glory to glory. So you have to prove, you have to discern, you have to work it out as you walk with God exactly what it is he wants you to do. And he's not going to tell you everything all at once. Get that out of your head. So many people are stuck back in the past with what God said to them 20 years ago, but you haven't got a prophetic word, a rainbow word to ask God, what are you saying to me now? You haven't gone into Revelation chapter 2 and 3 and asked the Lord to give you your grades. In Revelation 2 and 3, the Lord is not just giving grades to the churches. Uh, he has given grades to those specific churches, but the Lord is showing you part of his function now as he speaks from heaven is to give us grades as to how we're doing on earth. Are you living a life that's pleasing to Jesus? And the Lord gives grace in Revelation 2 and 3. And some people, you don't even know what I'm talking about. That's the first time you heard that in your life. That's why some Christians are so stagnant. Okay, they don't walk in the prophetic. They don't get rainbow words. They don't ask the Lord, where are you now? What are you saying to me now? Okay, which leads me back into what's going on with the beer bug. God moved away from religion and denominationalism at the end of 2014. Okay, so some people are, some saints are six years behind. And the Lord moved us out of that and moved us into moving into position in the body of Christ wherever he decided to place us, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of what you thought, regardless of denominational divisions, regardless of racism. The Lord started snapping us into place and some people still haven't got that, and that's why some churches are dying on the vine. It's six years later because the Lord moved. The Spirit shifted. The head of the church moved and called an end to all religion and denominationalism and division by color and ethnic groups six years ago at the end of 2014. And that's why churches that have moved towards a multicultural and multi-ethnic model are the churches that tend to be flourishing more. And the churches that are still back on worshiping in a segregated way, that we don't want to worship with those people and we don't, you know, like those people in our congregation and you want a homogenous con congregation, you want people that look like you, think like you, dress like you, and only have the same gifts you do, that's why churches like that are dying on the vine. Because God called for an end to that at the end of 2014. Okay? And so the reason that the beer bug is here right now, as I told you at the beginning of this broadcast, that's God wiping the chessboard. That's God wiping the checkerboard. That's God wiping the monopoly board, okay, for people that aren't listening to get our attention so that we can turn back to him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength and serve him in a way that is acceptable. Serve him in a way that's what he wants. And God is not about racism. I shouldn't have to say that to Christians, but I do. God is not about you turning your nose up at someone of a different ethnicity from you just because you don't like them. God has a purpose and a position on his body for every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. One more time. God has a purpose and a position on his body for every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. In other words, every ethnic group, every language, every people on the earth has a spot on God's body. Did you know that? You have a spot on Jesus' body. And when the Lord calls you into purpose, he calls you into the place he has ordained for you. So if you the eyes, you don't get to talk about the mouth. The mouth does what the mouth does. Eyes do what the eyes do. If you the elbow, you don't get to be the shoulder. You don't get to talk about the shoulder. You the elbow, you do what the elbow does and the shoulders do what the shoulders do. If you the stomach, you don't get to talk about the lungs. Stomach does what the stomach does. Lungs do what the lungs do. That's the way it works spiritually in the Lord's body, the same way it works in your physical body. You understand that? Your feet don't get to talk about your hands. Your hands do what they do. Your feet do what they do. But they both have position in your body. Which would you rather lose, your hands or your feet? And that answer is neither because they're both important. Which would you rather lose, your eyes or your ears? You want to be blind or you want to be deaf? And answers that and I'm not talking about blind or deaf people, so don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about you. I'm saying if you had a choice, which would you rather be, blind or deaf? And the answer to that question is neither. You want your eyes and your ears. 
That means that they both have value. That means that if you are serving or worshiping or just around, because we're not around anybody right now because of the lockdown, but if you are in a congregation where people are a different ethnic group than you or a different generation than you or they just have a different purpose than you, then God is not about that hatred and that envy and that covetousness and that racial hatred and that, that, that fury that people have sometimes when they have to get with people that are different from them. God called us as Christians to lead out alone to get over it six years ago. Now, let me speak for a moment specifically to black people. Okay, so all of you that are watching me that are not African or African-American, I'm specifically in this segment of the broadcast, I'm talking to African-Americans right now. Okay, just for a minute. If you are African-American, if you are black in America, you got no excuse. You have no excuse. There is no reason for you not to be serving the Lord. You know why? Because somebody in your family knows Jesus. If you black, somebody in your family knows the Lord. Your mom, your grandma, your big mama, your mother, your queen Esther, your dad, your grandfather, your play cousin, somebody, your play auntie, somebody in your family knows the Lord if you black. I don't care what you say. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what generation you come from. I don't care if you're 80. I don't care if you're 38. I don't care if you're 8. If you are African American, if you are black in America, somebody in your family knows the Lord. I don't care what you say. Do you know how I know that? Because we wouldn't have survived as a people we would not have survived as a people if our ancestors had not called on God. The Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. What happened between 1850 and 1964? Persecution, lynchings, segregation, everything possible, but black people didn't get wiped out. Why do you think we didn't get wiped out? Because the God of heaven had mercy on us because the Lord heard us call his name. And it wasn't no big daddy in the sky. It wasn't no man, the man upstairs. It was Jesus, J-E-S-U-S. -E Jesus the Christ, the son of the true and the living God. And your ancestors knew how to call on God. They knew how to pray until the Holy Ghost fell. They knew how to sing till the power of the Lord came down. That's why I don't care what you say. If you are African American, if you are black, you have no excuse not to be serving God in the fullness because somebody in your family knows the Lord. Somebody in your bloodline knows the Lord. Now, I'm not trying to put down other ethnic groups, so don't misunderstand me. I'm talking to my ethnic group, okay? I'm talking to my people. I'm talking to black people, African Americans. Somebody in your family knows the Lord, and we don't have any business, I don't care how old you are, what generation you're from. If you were born in anywhere, on the spectrum uh, of 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, if you were born in this century, you were 20 years old this year. I don't care how old you are. Somebody in your family knows the Lord, and we're supposed to be serving God because we're supposed to learn the lesson from Israel. When God delivered Israel, he did not want them to serve other gods. He wanted them to serve him because he's the one that brought them out of Egypt. Well, what do you think, how do you think God feels about black people when he's the one that brought us out of slavery? He's the one that deliver us, delivered us from our oppressors because if the Lord was not on our side as black people, as African Americans, we would have been wiped out. But we're still here because the Lord had his hand on us and the Lord had mercy on us. And because our forefathers knew how to call on God. So that's what I mean when I say, when you see a worldwide plague, this is not just a plague on America, this is a worldwide plague. And people are dropping and that death toll is escalating every day. That's the Lord trying to get people's attention. So that's got to start with the saints. That's got to start with the people that already know him. To turn from anything in your life that's not pleasing, excuse me, turn from anything in your life that's not pleasing to Christ. And to learn how to take up your cross. Now the old folks, now I grew up in one of them no excuse churches. Many, many churches have like maybe one family. The church I grew up in had like 12 or 15 families that all knew the Lord. Like family after family after family after family. And saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. And they told us as children, you going to get saved. You going to know the Lord. We didn't have, you know, they weren't asking us our opinion. 
You know, this was old school when the grown folks tell you, when the grown folks tell you to do something, you're going to do it because somebody grown told you what to do. And that's how I grew up. And they would bring us up to the altar and they would pray in tongues over us. And they would pray over us until the Holy Ghost fell because they were determined that we were going to know the Lord. We was going to feel his presence. We were going to feel his spirit for ourselves. I'm talking about from a child. Okay, that's the kind of church I grew up in. But a lot of black people grew up in churches like that. And then you're going to get grown and turn your back on what you know. You're going to get grown and turn your back on what you know and live lifestyles that you know ain't right in the eyes of God. You're going to get grown as a black person and turn your back on what brought us through all the sacrifice your mother made, all the sacrifice your father made, your grandparents, your grandparents in their 70s and 80s and 90s sometimes taking you to church, you sitting on their lap, them taking care of you. My grandma, my grandmother cooked us breakfast on Saturday. Them doing what they need to do to make sure that you knew the Lord. Praying over you, breaking demons off of you, giving you deliverance, even as a child. Praying over you in school, making sure that you stayed safe, that you could graduate. Praying over you and then so many of us in African-American communities in my generation and younger have had advanced education that our parents and grandparents never had. And we got all that because then people knew the Lord. We got all that because when people prayed and Jesus heard them. We got all that because the Lord delivered us. And now we're going to get grown and start acting a fool and start acting like we don't know what we know. <coughs> start acting like we don't know what's right and wrong in the eyes of the Lord as black people. Yeah, no. So if you are African-American, I'm still talking to black people, you don't have any excuse not to be serving God in the fullness. You don't have any excuse. You don't have any excuse. I don't care what you say. You have no excuse because somebody in your family knows the Lord. And when you get in trouble as a black person, what do you do? You go to church. One more time. When you get in trouble, remember, I'm not talking about other ethnic groups. I'm not putting you down. I'm not trying to disparage you. I'm talk talking specifically what I know because I'm black. If you are African American and you get in church, what, excuse me, you get in trouble, what do you do? You go to church. Why do you do that? You do that because you were taught that as a child because you know that when you get in trouble, the place to turn is Jesus. Not no man upstairs, not no big daddy in the sky, not no higher power. He's a person with a name. Our God is triune. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but the name that was given to us that we call on is the name of Jesus. He has the name that's above every name, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the one that is both God and man, that has one hand in the hand of the Father and one hand on the hand of man and unites us together in his own body. You can't even understand it. I can't even explain how, excuse me, such a thing is possible, but that's who the Lord is, and that's what he's done for us. And if you black, you know that. If you are black, you know that. If you black, you know that. You may not be living what you know, but you know. His name is Jesus, J-E-S-U-S. -E Jesus the Christ, the Son of the true and the living God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the one whose name is above every name. You know to call on him because you saw your mama call on him because you saw your grandmama call on him because you saw your pastor call on him. That's how you know that if you're black. I don't care what you say. So I'm addressing my people and I'm addressing the saints, but I'm trying to let you know that when you see a plague sweeping across the world, you going to get right or you going to get dead. Do you understand that playtime is over? Do you understand that the world hasn't seen anything like this? Do you understand that this is not a joke? This is not a joke. This is not a game. You understand that? You're going to get right with God or you're going to get dead. You, your whole family might get wiped out. What if all the males in your family get wiped out and there's no more seed with that name? That's what God get, did to King Saul except for Mephibosheth. Uh, which brings me to another point. If you're double-minded, because again, remember I always show you in the Bible what I'm talking about, then I show you in real life. In the Bible, somebody that was double-minded with uh, Yahweh, Jehovah, in the Old Testament was King Saul, the first king of Israel.
Now remember that God did not want the monarchy. God told his people, I'm your king. You don't need a human king. You don't need anyone to sit on the throne. I'm your king. I'll lead you. And they said, no, no, no. We want a king. We want to be like other nations. So God said, okay, if that's what you want. It's one of the worst mistakes they ever made. But the first king that they picked, God did not pick him, by the way. They picked King Saul because he was tall and nice looking and came from a good family. He was wishy-washy. He was double-minded. His heart and his mind was not faithful to God. So King Saul <clears throat> wanted a little bit of God and a little bit of King Saul and a little bit of what God said and a little bit of what the people say and a little bit of what God thought and a little bit of what he thought and a little bit of the spirit and a little bit of the flesh. And God got so mad at that, God did several things. God told him, if you had been faithful to me, I would have established your kingdom on earth forever. But now I'm going to take the kingdom from you and give it to a neighbor that's better than you. And God cursed King Saul with schizophrenia. God said, you want to be double-minded? I'm going to lock you in it. And King Saul became schizophrenic. And he had an uh, evil spirit that troubled him. And King David, he wasn't king yet, but young David had to come in and play his flute and play his lyre. And when he played his anointed music, the evil spirit would depart. Because Saul was tormented from that point until he died. And he ran around because the Lord stopped talking to him. And he let Saul live long enough to see his replacement, King David, come up. That's what God does when you get double-minded. When your old folks used to call that one foot in the world, one foot in the church. Well, you say, Prophet Taylor, that's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the Lord says, I wish that you were cold or hot. But because you are lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. The Lord said, it's them, them kind of Christians and people that just, you know, if you hot, if you on fire for Christ, no problem. If you cold, no problem because the Lord can warm you up. It's them people that are just kind of lukewarm. And the Lord gives us a very nasty picture. He said, Tuh! He said I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Do you understand? So now is the time to turn to the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, just like the scripture says, and love him with all that you have. And just like the scripture says, to love your neighbor as yourself, to stop hating your fellow man because they're a different color, because they're a different ethnicity, because they have a different primary language than you. They have a spot in the Lord's body. Okay. One more thing I'm going to say, and then I'm going to be done for today. <clears throat> the other thing I want to say is, remember, I want you to go watch Answers Part 1, the initial video, because I go into detail of the things that, as the body of Christ, we need to repent of. So I didn't want to repeat that information here. I already said it in Answers Part 1, okay, last week. But another thing that uh, I need you to understand, that you need to understand, is that you don't get to decide who God uses. God uses whom he chooses, and God chooses whom he uses. That's up to him. That's up to him, the head of the church of Jesus Christ, the one that died to make the kingdom of heaven accessible to men. If you saw the Lord and he reached out to you, you would see the nail print in his hand. Show me the nail print in your hand. Show me where you were nailed to a cross and you shed your blood to redeem people and to open up the kingdom of heaven to mankind. Show me where you did that and I'll stop talking. Oh, I'm sorry, that's Jesus. The Lord is the one that did that. <clears throat> you don't get to decide. People don't have to be saved enough for you. Wherever they are in their walk with God, if God chooses to use, for example, an ex-murderer and a felon, if he chooses to use them, that's up to him. He did that in the scriptures with Moses. Moses was living as a prince of Egypt. He saw one of his fellow Hebrews, because Moses knew he was a Hebrew. He saw one of his fellow Hebrews being persecuted. He rose up and he killed the Egyptian that was whipping that Hebrew. He said, oh Lord, I have committed murder and everybody going to find out. And Moses ran. And Moses stayed on a run for 40 years. He was 40 years old when he did that. And God caught back up with Moses at the age of 80. That's how old Moses was when he saw the burning bush. And God turned Moses around and told him, go back down there and tell Pharaoh that I said to let my people go. God took a, a, a murderer and a felon and caused him to write the first five books in the Bible. That's who Moses was. In the New Testament, it would be Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul was Saul of Tarsus. He was a professional Christian killer. He had papers, marching papers. He had orders from the Jewish council and from the governments he was under to arrest Christians, people that were professing, because remember, 
During Paul's day, Christianity, as we know it, was brand new. Jesus was uh, crucified, buried, rose again the third day, stayed on earth 40 more days, and then ascended back into heaven. And Peter, James, and John, although James got killed early, they killed James early in the book of Acts with a sword. But the people that knew Jesus personally and saw him rise from the grave began to preach and teach the good news of the kingdom that the man, Jesus Christ, that they killed was actually the Son of God, was God in the flesh. So Christianity in, in Saul of Tarsus' day was brand new. And a lot of people thought it was heresy. So he had legal papers that allowed him to arrest people that professed the name of Christ and drag them off to jail and sometimes have them killed. Jesus stopped Paul, stopped Saul on the road to Damascus, on his way to the city of Damascus, blinded him, revealed himself to Saul in a very personal way, changed his name to Paul, and Paul became an apostle. And Apostle Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. Did you know that a Christian killer wrote the majority of the New Testament? Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon. Some people say Paul wrote Hebrews. Some people say Luke wrote Hebrews. Some people say uh, Apollos wrote Hebrews. But all them other books I just named are Paul for sure. Okay? All those are Pauline letters. All those are Pauline epistles. The man whose words you read, I just got through reading Romans 12, 1 and 2. The man whose words you read was a man that was a former Christian killer. He killed Christians for a living. God stopped him, turned him around, and God used him to write the majority of the New Testament. So God used a killer in the Old Testament to write the first five books of the Bible, and God used a killer in the New Testament to write the majority of the New Testament. God uses whom he chooses, and he chooses whom he uses. Why do I bring that up? Some of y'all have a past. Some of y'all look like people are always talking about you. People in church are always cutting their eyes at you because they're, they're condemning you for, for things in the past. If God has chosen to use you in the present, that's between you and him. Don't pay them folks no mind. But if you are one of them people, you better keep your mouth off of folks that God is using. If God has put his word in their mouth, that means they're good enough for him. And if somebody good enough for God, they're good enough for me. Okay? If God has said you're over, like he did King Saul, you are over. And there's not a single thing you can do about it. And some of y'all have seen that. You've seen ministers that you love, but God wiped their ministry out. There's nothing you can do if God has said you're over. But if God has decided to use you to do a mighty work, like he did two murderers in the Bible, then you better stay out their way and you better keep your mouth off of them. Because if it's good enough for God, it's good enough for me. It's not up to me to decide who saved enough for me. It's up for me to get my heart and my mouth and my mind and my body right with God. And that's my only job. And then after that, to love my neighbor as myself. So... If somebody's trying to persecute you because of things you did in the past, God's going to deal with them. Because who are they to condemn someone that God has forgiven? And if you're struggling with that, then forgive yourself. If, God, if the blood of Jesus is good enough for God, it is good enough for me. And it's good enough for you. And so I'm saying all that to say during, while we're doing the beer bug stuff, that we are supposed to be humbling ourselves and praying and turning back to God with our whole hearts and seeking his face and making sure that everything in our life as believers is lined up with what God wants it to be. Because we are in a time and a season that if you don't do that, you're going to die. Did you hear what I said? You're going you're gonna to get right or you're going to die. Playtime is over. Grace is up. It's not a joke. It's not a game. Is life and death, just like the Bible always tells us that we have to choose life or choose death. Well, that is literally what you're living in now. Worldwide, not just in America, across the entire globe. You have to choose, do you want to live or do you want to die? If you want to live, you're going to have to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You're going to have to make the Lord your dwelling. You're going to have to make Him your secret place. There's no more options. You understand that we don't have anything left but the word of God? Do you understand that? 
Do you understand that there is nothing left right now except the word of God? No business, no career, stock market crashed, you know, fighting over supplies. Can't even go outside, entire cities on lockdown, entire nations on lockdown. Do you understand that there is nothing left? There's not a single thing left to turn to except the Lord. Accept the word of God. That's all that's left. So I stopped by to tell you that's what we're supposed to be doing. And we as believers are supposed to be an example to those that don't believe that, that we can get along, that we can get along despite generational differences, despite ethnic differences, despite skin color differences, despite culture differences, that we can get along under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, under the banner of Jesus Christ. You understand? Okay. All right. Holy Ghost is telling me to hit this, this thing one more time and then I'm going to be gone. I said this last week, but it's important enough to repeat again today. I'm going to show you why I don't care if people call me crazy. Oh, Prophet Taylor, you're just crazy. I See, that's wrong with you Christians. You believe stuff that you can't prove. Oh, Prophet Taylor, <clears throat> you just crazy. You just... All that stuff you're saying, you can't prove it. It ain't real. Your God ain't real. It's just something in your head. Okay. Okay. Then let me read something to you. I'm going to read to you Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. I'm reading out of the King James Version. I did this last week, but Holy Ghost told me to do it again. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, how much more plain does that have to be? God said, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for these fathers, these men out here, to take a vested interest in your children and raising your children in the fear of the Lord and teaching your sons and your daughters to know him. Because that's your job if you the daddy. If you the daddy, it's your job to make sure that your sons and your daughters know the Lord. And I'm not saying that the mama doesn't have a role, because of course she does. But I'm saying as the head of the house, in the eyes of God, it's your responsibility as the man to set the spiritual tone. Or as Joshua said in the scriptures, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Notice he didn't say, I'm going to ask people in my family what they think about that. Because Joshua was the man over his family. It's going to go like he said it's going to go, because men are in the headship position. That's why God said to turn the heart of the fathers. The fathers, if you are daddy, your heart has got to be towards your children, teaching your children the way of God, raising up a generation that God is pleased with so he can use your children and your grandchildren in their generation to be a witness for him on earth. That's your job, if you the daddy, to make your children, make your children followers of him. Then he said, and the heart of the children to the fathers, you children, you've got to stop cussing your father out. When my father's no good, he might have been no good, but he's still your daddy. He's the physical vehicle that God used to help bring you in this world. He brought you in this world because of the seed of your father and the womb of your mother. And there are blessings on both sides of your family. There's generational blessings that God built into you because of the people he sent you through. Do you realize that? Do you realize that some of the gifts you have and some of the things that you can do is because God sent you through the bloodline he sent you through? He chose to send you through your mother and father. Maybe your mother abused you, and that's not right. And maybe your father abused you, abandoned you, neglected you, and that's not right. Eventually, you have to grow to the point where if you can't say anything but thank you, God, for the people you sent me through. Thank you, God, for my parents. Because God is saying we got to stop these children cussing their parents out. Calling your mom and your daddy by their first name. Cussing them out. Getting all ugly. Being disrespectful. Your mom and your daddy working 40, 50, 60 hours a week to put a roof over your head. To put food in your stomach. To put clothes on your back. To get an education in your head. They're doing that. They're sacrificing what they could be doing to make sure you're okay. And you're going to disrespect them? I stop by to tell you that every time you sign your name, that's your daddy's name. One more time, in case you think I stuttered. Every time you sign your name, that's your daddy's name. 
I have two children. Every time they sign their name, they sign Taylor. That's my name. They not bastards because of me. That's my name. Every time my children sign their name, they sign their name Taylor. That's my name because I'm the daddy. Okay? And you're going to cuss your father out? You're going you, you, to you're gonna just rebuke your father? You're just going to treat your father like that? God said no. God said I need these men to have their hearts towards their children. And God said I need these children to stop disrespecting your daddy. Stop disrespecting your daddy. Stop disrespecting your daddy. And then God said, lest I come. God said, if y'all are not doing what I'm telling you to do, God said, I'm going to jump in it. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, what just happened? What has just happened in the last 10 days? The beer bug, that's what happened. It's been here since January, but it's impacted the world differently and different nations have had different reactions to it. God just smote the whole world with a curse. Did I just read that verse in the Bible? That's why I don't care if people call me crazy. Ain't no more prophets, whatever. Well, you call yourself a prophet, whatever. That's what's wrong with you Christians. You believe in an invisible God that's not there, whatever, whatever you say, I don't care what you say. You are living in the word of God playing out right now. God said, if these men don't raise their children to love him and fear him, and if these children are disrespecting your father, every time you sign your check, you sign in your daddy's name. And you're disrespecting the man that God used you to bring you in this world. God said, I'm going to get in it. And I'm going to smite the earth. He did not say, I'm going to smite a town, a village, a, a, a city, a region. He did not even say a nation. He did not even say a continent. What God said is, I'm going to smite the earth. And I'm going to ask you again, what's been happening for the last two weeks? There has been a worldwide plague, and we are smitten with that plague to the point where we can't go outside except to get groceries, medicine, gas, and some people are getting a beer bug from the gas pump. Oh yeah, if you didn't know that, you got to use gloves and wipe everything down when you go get gas. Because some people are getting a beer bug just from the gas pump. Entire cities are locked down. Entire states are locked down, like Illinois, Connecticut, uh, California, New York, here in the United States. But some nations are locked down, like Italy. But the whole country. Okay? So, God said that in the Bible. That's why I don't care how many people call me crazy. I don't care what you say. You are living in the word of God being played out right in front of you. So, that means those of us that fear the Lord, and those of us that believe God, and those of us that know God, got to get our families in order. You got to get the right order back in the family. You've got to get the order that's in the scripture, that Christ is the head of everybody in the family. Men are in a headship position. Women are in a submissive position. And children are in the obedience position. That's in Ephesians 5 and 6. Lest you think I'm making that up. I'm not making that up. That's what the scriptures say. Do you want me to read it to you? I will read it to you. Okay. So we're going to start with Ephesians 5. Just so you know, I'm not making that up. Okay. Well, that's, oh, well, that's, people don't live that way no more. Well, that's, you say what you want to say. I just showed you in the Old Testament how the word of God is alive right now. You're living out the word of God right now from Malachi. So I don't care what you say about the Bible. I don't care what you say about it being relevant. I don't care what you call me. Okay. Do you understand that you're going to die? Do you understand you're making fun of the Lord? Do you understand you're not fearing God? Do you understand you're living any kind of way you want to? Do you understand that you're going to die? Is that funny? Okay. All right. Okay, Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as, as unto the Lord. Submit yourselves, wives are in a submissive position. For the husband is the head of the wife. Men are in the headship position. Even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. 
Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. That's God's word, not my word. And if you want to make fun of it and you want to rebel against it, go ahead. You want to say that's old and archaic? Go ahead. That, those are God's words, not mine. Okay? Husbands, Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. Verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. There it is in the scripture that men are in the headship position and we're supposed to love our wives as we love ourselves and wash them with the word. Women are in a submissive position and they're supposed to submit to their husbands as unto the Lord. Now I will next read to you what it says about children because that is in Ephesians 6. Ephesians uh, 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Right there in the scripture. If you're a child, you're in the obedience position. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first command with a promise. That's what God says. He does not say honor your father and your mother if they're perfect. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first command with a promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's the same thing God said in Malachi. You know, what does it mean to provoke your child to wrath? It means that you make them feel like that they can't please you no matter what they do. You neglect them, you abuse them, you're going to raise some angry children. Why do you think we have so many angry children? <clears throat> we have neglected them. We have abused them. We have not taught them to fear the Lord, but the Lord says to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Nurture means love, but it also means teaching and training. Admonition means warning. It means warning. It means you have to tell your children, baby, baby, baby girl, baby boy, you can't live any kind of way you want to. The way to live is to live pleasing to God, and God will bless you with blessings in this life, and God will bless you with long life. And God will honor you when you honor him. That's supposed to come out the mouth of your daddy from the time you leave your mother's womb. So you know how life on earth goes. That's our job as the daddy. But the children have to submit to it. And if they are disobedient and rebellious, then God already told you that when you don't obey your parents and when you don't honor your parents, it's not going to be well with you and you're not going to live long. Dishonoring your parents cuts your life short. That's right there in the scripture. That's God's word, not my words. That's why I don't care what people say. I don't care what you say. If you don't like what the Lord God Almighty says, see, I'm, I'm trembling just saying it because that's blasphemous. If you don't like what the Lord God Almighty have to say, then that's between you and him. And God will deal with you on that for, for saying that his word has no meaning or that he don't know what he's talking about. And he's the one that invented families. He invented families, he invented men, he invented women, women, he invented sex, he invented children, he invented generations, you know, like grandparents, parents, grandparents, you know, grandchildren. God invented all that. We didn't invent none of that. None of that is our invention. Oh, that's him. And this is how he says to do it, right there in the scripture. He said, this how the family go. The one that invented the family, he said, this how it go. So I, me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Okay, so, so again, I beseech you and I implore you, just like Apostle Paul, that now is the time to let go of your agenda, let go of your racism, let go of your denominationalism, let go of your saying there ain't any more apostles and prophets, incorrect. Just because your denomination doesn't walk in the prophetic doesn't mean the prophetic isn't true. The apostolic and the prophetic is needed now more than ever. Okay? And you better get your house right. God said it's so important to him that, that the father's hearts are turned towards the children and the children's hearts are turned toward the fathers. God said it's so important to him that if y'all ain't doing that, I'm going to smite the whole earth with a curse. And what are we living in now? There's your proof that the word of God is playing out right in front of you. Okay? 
All right, uh, I've gone over time, but I believe that was necessary. Uh, I wanted to be sure I gave you everything that the Holy Ghost wanted me to give you. Uh, the Spirit of God is telling me right now, Rhema Word, the, the Lord is telling me through the Holy Ghost, that there is a sweet blessing coming for those that heed this word. Yea, says the Lord, that if you listen to my word and you read my word and you align your family according to my commandments, you fear me, you honor me, and you love it, but rather fear me, obey me, love me, and I will breathe upon you and your household with a sweet blessing for those that honor this word, says the Spirit of the living God. Wow. I'm with it. I want that sweet blessing. You know why I want that sweet blessing? Because I know that God can always do more for you than you could ever do for yourself. One more time. God could always do more for you than you could ever do for yourself. So again, I, I know my Facebook thing kind of glitched. Remember, I always put the links to Periscope and YouTube so you can see the whole word in case it was a glitch. But what the Holy Ghost just gave me was to say that there's a sweet blessing for those that honor this word. So for those of us that will love God, fear God, and obey God and align our families with the scripture, the Holy Ghost said there's a sweet blessing that's going to come upon us and our household. And I'll take it. I want that sweet blessing. Okay? Because I know it was glitching while I was saying that because, of course, the devil's always trying to mess with the prophetic word. But whatever. The devil can't stop. The anointed word of God. The devil cannot stop the anointed word of God. All right? So that's it for today. Praise God and amen. If you got any prayer requests, put them on the screen right now. Got anything you want me to pray for, put it on the screen right now. If not, then I will see you next Sunday. Now, my prophetic devotional quarter two is out. Okay? Quarter two starts on April 1st. It is on the website now, uh, so you can uh, order your Prophetic Quarter 2 devotionals. I actually strongly suggest you order them because, you know, there's been a lot of delays in shipping, and if you want there to be a clear transition from March into April, because I released them by quarters. So the first quarter, January, February, March, is up in a few days. Second quarter, um, April, May, and June, is available, and it's on the website now. I will put the link. Uh, in this video, uh, on my Twitter, uh, and uh, on the YouTube channel, okay? And then uh, whenever I have new music to release, I release that on New Music Friday. So always check my page, or you can look up the hashtag PDT, hashtag PDT, hashtag New Music Friday to see my latest track, because I'm always releasing uh, my music now as well. But that prophetic devotional is available. So I put the link in all these various places. So I want to thank those of you that Listen to the podcast. Thank, th thank you to those of you that watch me live on Facebook and like to share the video. Thank those of you that watch me on Periscope. And also thank those of you that are watching the replay. And thank and bless those of you that are also watching on YouTube. Okay? So the Lord has some serious things to say. So as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And it's as simple as that for me. So God bless you. I want to encourage you to hear and heed what the Spirit is saying to the church that we might be pleasing to God during this time and that, that we might live lives and align our lives with God's word, that his fierce wrath might be removed and we can get through this and we can love him and serve him and fear him the way he wants us to. Amen and God bless you. I'll see you next time.